Thank you, Janet. <laughs> Praise team. Uh, before I start the message, I want to read a note that I got um, it was this past week, I think, in the mail. Dear Pastor Russ, we watch you in a New Leaf Land for both services in Ohio and in Florida. Not, we don't do services in Florida. They go to Florida. Um, I, I think, well, yeah, I think you're even better that w- than you were in last year. I don't know what that means. <laughs> anyway, you have a great support staff. Dave and Jeff, as they are terrific with their prayers, and now we have Janet doing prayers as well. Also, the guy with the collection of vests. <laughs> and they point out, apparently they might think there's more than one, Tom. He is our only guy with a collection of vests. But anyway, the guy with collection of vests does a fabulous job. In addition, Christine does a terrific job filling in, uh, let's see, what does it say? Addressing all of you in New Leaf Land. And, and here's a part that's really, really encouraging to me because I know this is, this is true and we feel it. Um, it really shows all of your staff is filled with the Holy Spirit, with their words and their expressions, especially, and they, the blonde who plays piano and sings in the choir. I think they know that we're married. Um, she's a keeper, enclosed as a t- token of our appreciation. But that, the point of that note to me is, and, and we talk about this as a staff all the time. It's amazing to me. Debbie comes up with these children's messages and they, ma- they match what we're doing. And it might look to you all that we sit down and plan all these things out. What we do is we pray about it and we trust that God's going to lead us and that God's going to put all of this together and it's going to come out in a way that doesn't bring glory or recognition to any one of us, but to the one who brings us together. And that includes, includes the folks in the, in the sound booth as well. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I am a challenge for anybody, you know, Bob with the camera now that gets nervous when I get too far away from the pulpit and, you know, but he hangs in there and, and uh, none of this, none of this would mean much if you guys didn't show up. And that includes those of you who are in New Leaf land. It's been amazing. It's been a blessing to watch how people can get connected and stay connected even if they can't be in the same place that we are. But Tom says this occasionally, and I have to say this, there is something powerful about being together in the same place for worship because God calls us together and God knows what he's doing. And he, he created this place that we live in. He created us and he knows what strengthens us. And he knows what weakens us and he knows that we need to be together. We are created for relationships. Relationships. It doesn't matter how many relationships you have, we are all created for relationships. Some of us have really strong relationships with other human beings, um, and that can make us feel like perhaps we have all we need. And sometimes we have really broken relationships with other human beings, and, and that, those times can make us realize how desperately we need um, relationships. But all of the relationships that we are a part of, all of them, are secondary to the one that we have with the God who created us. That's the reason I'm here, really. Um, somebody asked me this last week when, how long I'd been doing ministry, and I was really stunned when I, I answered it, and I thought, wow, 30 years. That's just, I mean, I, it seems like I'm just getting started. <laughs> I, I, part of me thought, I ought to be better at it after 30 years. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, I've been doing it for that long? I oh, it's been fun. It, it, is, it is because of who God is that any of this makes a difference, not because of what I do or anybody else. We're going to look at God's Word today. We're taking a jump into Romans, and this is a challenging book. We're going to look at Romans 8 for a couple of weeks, and we're going to spend a little bit more time in Romans as we get into uh, the time for, uh, for Advent, for Christmas. We're going to look a little bit more at the, at the theme of glory, bringing God glory, and what God's glory is. But we're going to start in Romans. Um, we're going to be in chapter 8 today for the next couple of weeks because in Romans chapter 8, we get to see, I think, a really deep dive into, we've been talking about prayer this is really, I think, where, um, where the fullness of the spiritual impact of prayer comes together in Romans. Um, so let's pray for a moment before we get into God's word. 
These are your words, God, and I just ask that you would keep me out of the way. Help me to say what it is that you have to say. Help me to, to, to be your servant. Um, and as I surrender to you, and as you bless us, help us to be grateful for all that you give us. And for that, I thank you and praise you in advance. Amen. One phrase that I want you to leave with today and I want you to hang on to for at least three weeks trying to figure out what it means. And I mean this when I say it. I really want you to just take this phrase as we've been talking about prayer, as you've been doing it in your life, I want you to do, just look for how this phrase applies in your prayer life and see where it, where it takes you. Because I really think um, that, that this can open some eyes. Prayer is convergence think about that prayer is convergence um, and what I mean by that we'll unpack but primarily what I mean by that what I think scripture says to us is that prayer is the place that God and I come together this is the place where my will and God's will converge and sometimes my will goes a different direction but God's will is still there and still solid and I have the choice get off track I can reconverge. I can look for how God connects with me, how God connects me with the world. Convergence is how we come together, and prayer is something that joins us. You know, as I say, that the folks that are planning worship pray about worship. They don't pray about my will. They pray about what God wants us to do, and that brings together all of the ideas and all of the energy into one unified whole because of convergence. Prayer is convergence. It's where we discover who God is to us. Remember, we worship a God who intentionally created each one of us differently. We need a personal relationship with God. We each of us need. For me to converge with God's will for my life doesn't help you enough. I mean, it can be a, a blessing in, in terms of my spiritual leadership, but we each need to connect. We've got to get connected to who God is. And because God doesn't manipulate, because God doesn't coerce, convergence is the word I like because it suggests that we're making a choice and so is God. We come together because God wants to be con connected to us and we need to be connected to God. So we're going to look at Romans 8. I'm going to read Romans 8, verses 18 to 27. I want you to understand there's so much packed into this that uh, you're not going to get it the first time around. I still don't get all of it, and I've been looking at it for quite some time. So don't be, don't be too worried about, oh my gosh, I'm not sure I retained everything that was in there. Um, it's, it's, there's a lot there. But if you have a Bible or a phone, this would be a great time to, to follow along. <clears throat> I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Wow, there's a lot in there, isn't there? <laughs> We're going to take part of it apart, but I want to start with, with one phrase I think is absolutely critical, and that is the idea of hope. It starts out with, verse 24 says, in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Reading a, a spiritual author, Richard Rohr, and he makes a comment in there, in, early in this um, book, it, um, 
scripture as spirituality, but um, he talks about how he sees the quest for knowledge getting in the way of building our faith. And I started thinking about that, and he's right. If I want to, if I want to explain everything that's happening, I'm gonna limit God to my own training and my own understanding, but most importantly, to my own vocabulary. If I want to explain what God's doing, if I want to understand the word of God and the work of God and the people of God and the purpose of God's kingdom, and if I want to understand the truth of scripture, if I seek to understand, if I seek to understand, I'm no longer living by faith because I don't need to have faith in what I've already seen happen. I don't need to have faith, and that doesn't mean that there isn't truth, there is. There are things that don't change, that truth is out there and it's real and truth belongs to God. But what we need to seek is not just to understand, not just to claim. We want so many assurances. We want to be able to explain things to the point that we feel comfortable, that they're secure, that they're not going to change. And this is a great human fear. We fear change, we fear decay. What we fear then is that things that we used to know and love aren't the way they used to be. We have, all of us have experienced that in different ways. We experience that with the changing life of the church. We experience that with the changing abilities of our own bodies, the things that I used to be able to remember very quickly, I now take a little bit longer to remember. And the places I used to go, used to never feel like my, my knees ached at the top of a long, long flight of steps or top of a mountain. I get halfway up and there's a little bit of pain in there now. Maybe there'll be more in the future. It looks to me like perhaps my body is decaying. Seems like things are starting to wear out. And that's the reality that we all face. And so as our bodies begin to decay and our lives start to fall apart and our relationships look like they might be tense as well, we start to feel like maybe we're going to be left alone. We start to wonder if the things that we've relied on are gonna be around forever because we seek eternity. It's absolutely true. I don't know anybody, if they're, when you listen to their conversations about things that challenge us, things that frighten them, it's eternity that we're confused by. We're not confused by what we see and hear in the, in the present tense. We're not really confused by what we can touch and measure. We are confused and concerned about eternity because it doesn't make sense to us. We can't understand it completely. We know it's there, but we can't explain it. You take all those pieces together and we can begin to wonder. And what we wonder is does God really care? And let me tell you, it's not wrong to feel that. You're not an unbeliever. You're not, you're not dishonoring God to simply ask that question. God, do you really care? To ask yourself, does God really care about me? And, and the other question, do I really care about God? Does what, what I say about God, does it really make a difference in my life? Am I really willing to live it? Or do I just go through the motions? If you haven't had that kind of angst, if you haven't been in that place, you haven't paid enough attention to your spiritual life. There needs to be a time when we ask the question, what's going on here? What's happening in the world around me? What's happening in the lives of the people around me? Who are you, God, and where are you? What are you doing right now? Are you gonna be there? Are you listening to my prayers? Are you watching my life? Are you aware of the challenges that I face? Are you listening when I jump for joy? Are you there when I celebrate? All of these things are the real truth of what we seek as human beings. And when we seek to know these things, we seek to understand these things, unfortunately, we begin to lose hope because you can't hope where you have knowledge. It's not hope, it's understanding, it's comprehension, it's prediction, there's all kinds of things that go along with that. What we need, we need to to recapture the uncertainty of faith, the uncertainty that creates hope. I don't know what tomorrow is gonna be, but I know this, beyond a shadow of a doubt, because I've been at difficult and dark times, 
I've been at times where I didn't know what was going to happen next. And I can tell you, the thing that gives me hope, the thing that I am certain of but can't prove to anybody else, is that God's going to be there that God's here for me now and that God's going to be there in the future and I don't need to explain it. I don't need to understand where I'm going to be tomorrow. I don't need to understand what I'm going to be doing tomorrow. What I need to know is that God is, is going to be there and that God understands, that God cares about the part of my life that I can't explain, that I can't control, that I can't provide for, the part of my life that leaves things uncertain, the things that I don't even know what to ask for. Because there are times I think to myself, if I could have anything in the world, what would I ask God for? And I don't have an answer to that that seems adequate. This is where prayer is convergence. This sense of part of ourselves that is uncertain. What do we do with it? We take it to God. And when we take it to God, a couple of things happen. First, we recognize that hope and knowledge are not compatible. Paul writes in Romans 8, 24, for in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? So it seems odd, but all the knowledge that you have is hopeless. And if you try to build a life on knowledge and information, if you try to construct a future based on what you know and what you can predict, you can do those things and there's nothing wrong with them, but they are hopeless activities. When you can predict it, when you can know it, when you can define it, there isn't hope. It doesn't require hope. And that's not to say there's anything wrong with that. That's to say we're missing part of the puzzle. We're getting part of it accurately, this quest for understanding. All truth is God's truth. And God deals in truth and truth alone. But if this universe is bigger than what I can understand, and if this God can save me from myself and my sins, if there is a future glory, something that I can't imagine right now has to be part of it. Because if I can imagine my destiny, what what is a destiny about? If I can imagine it, if you think about this, if you knew what was going to happen, everything that was going to happen to you for the next 30 days, and you knew it wasn't going to change, you would be hopeless. A few days into that, you would start to despair. I know this because as a pastor, I've heard this in so many people's voices. When it begins to look like the future isn't going to change, and you might think that that's a future that is only going downhill. But I've heard it from folks whose, whose lives were prosperous and seemed together, that it seemed like they knew everything that was going to happen. They had all their plans in place. And life couldn't get any better. And out of that comes despair. Because it is an existence without hope. Hope happens when we allow faith to tell us something that we can't prove. Hope happens when we don't have to explain. I mean, it's okay for people to try to explain the miracles in the Bible, but you know what? I don't want an astronomer to tell me that there would have been an astronomical event that would have had a star in the sky over Bethlehem so, so many years ago. I don't want to hear that because the truth is, I believe that to be true because that's what scripture says. And I need that to be an act of faith. If I try to prove everything that I've experienced in faith, then I don't have any real faith. I have understanding, I have information, I have knowledge. That's not the same as faith. And when I don't act with faith, I can't live with hope. And when we don't have hope, we are hopeless. Even if it seems like things are going well. Prayer is where all of this human mess converges with who God is. See, the beautiful thing about prayer is it takes the part of us that's human that can be focused on on some of the right things and some of the wrong things and not all the right things at any one time. And we can sometimes be positive and sometimes be negative. But when we are hopeless, God touches our heart and gives us hope. God listens to the brokenness, to the excitement, to the joy. God listens to all the things that you can't articulate. 
the lists that you make of everything good, when you get to the list of everything good, and there's that thing that you can't describe, there's that thing that you can't explain completely. It's like an example, I don't know if you guys know that I get to be the chaplain for the football team, which means I do absolutely nothing but watch. Um, and that's in everybody's best interest. But well, that's not true. I pray for these guys the entire time they're playing. I, what I focus on is praying for the guys that are on the field and, and for the coaches on the sidelines. So at the end of the game Friday night, it was an outstanding game. If you didn't watch it, um, you should have. But it was an outstanding game. And I, and I watched these guys who were so excited. And I watched Rocco who was so excited. But then I listened to Rocco trying to explain, trying to put into words that feeling. Couldn't do it, could you? I mean, it was, he did a good job, did a good job of trying to explain it. But the reality is that moment, that feeling was something that went well beyond words, well beyond words. I watched the band in the stands coming unglued. I mean, these guys, I, I, this, is at, this is on Friday. These are teenagers on Friday. They've been through school all week long. You'd think that they sat at home waiting for Friday to happen. All, all this energy, words can't describe what's happening. When I get home from church, my kids are going to be there. I haven't seen them in a while. And there's going to be a, a, something in my heart that I can't explain. You guys know what I'm talking about though, right? This is where God connects with us. The stuff that we can explain in human language is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But we need to connect with God on the level that we can't explain to anybody else. We need to know that when it's a, a Friday night football game, whether we win, because the week before that, it was hard to come up with something to say as well. Whether we're in victory or whether we're in crisis, we need to pause, shut off the desire to define and the need to explain and allow ourselves to be. That's the convergence of prayer. When we say God is, I am, we're in this together. And I don't have to know what's coming in the future because I know who's controlling it for me. And I don't have to worry about the mistakes I'm gonna make because God can bring victory from all of them. And I don't have to be concerned about my destiny because it is guaranteed in Christ. And it's guaranteed in Christ to be better than anything I could ever imagine, articulate, conjure, dream up. I've said this about my wonderful wife many times. If God had said to me when I was in college, hoping one day to find a, a, a life mate, if God said, give me your list, Russ, tell me everything, every characteristic, every possibility, every bit of a personality, describe everything and I'll give you in, in a wife exactly what you describe. Folks, I would have fallen so far short of what God actually gave me. I, I do not have the ability to describe or to explain what it is that is a great blessing. I have, I have no knowledge about the faith that God's gonna give me to get through whatever's happening tomorrow. And I don't want to know it. Because if I know it, I'm not living by faith. And if we are not living by faith, we are, believe it or not, no matter how things seem to be good, we are in a hopeless mode. And I will tell you, if, if you look around and listen and think that the people around you are hopeless, but things are going well in their lives, it's not because they don't appreciate what they have, it's because they haven't looked for something that they can't understand. You've got to let go of this notion that you get it. And I hear this, one of the reasons that somebody, I brought up that 30 years in ministry, here's why, when I was at the prison, I was talking to one of the guys, and they said, how long have you been a pastor? And, and I said, wow, wow, 30 years. And I said something like, man, after 30 years, you'd think I'd know a little bit more what I was doing. And this man said, but isn't it that way with faith, that the deeper your faith grows, the more you realize that you don't understand anything? When it comes to matter of faith, here's the reality, folks. I truly do understand far less today than I understood when I started at this thing. And that, for me, is the basis of hope. Because hope picks up 
where my ability leaves off. Hope lifts me up when I can't climb any farther. Hope takes me into a future that I can't imagine without fear because I know that my God is taking me there. And if God is leading me there, I don't need to understand it. If God is going to be with me there, I know it's going to be better. And, and here's the hardest thing in the world because I have been on a quest for knowledge all of my life. My, the, the first television that I got banned from watching because it was too early in the morning was not cartoons. It was this black and white college guy giving lectures online. My mom and dad couldn't imagine why we would want to watch it. Frankly, I don't know why I wanted to either, except he talked about things that were interesting. And I listened to this guy on black and white TV at five o'clock in the morning and he spoke in a monotone and they didn't have any kind of a set or anything. It was just a guy in a lab coat talking about stuff. And I was fascinated. I have always liked to learn. I've always liked to seek out information. But what I have experienced, and it comes through prayer primarily, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. This doesn't mean brokenness only although it can. The Spirit helps in our weakness when I can't explain something. I was telling Lynn, fall is one of the seasons I experience the, 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 ex, the experience of FOMO, fear of missing out. When the colors start to change, the leaves start to change, I get so, I, get, I can get a little bit wound up like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be too much inside, not enough outside, I'm gonna miss those beautiful colors. And then when I drive down the road and I see them, I'm like, I wanna be able to describe them. That's when I realize, here's the thing. Here's what's happening to me. When I want to capture those colors and I want to preserve those colors, I want to be able to explain those colors, I am living hopelessly because I'm trying to understand. And if I can understand, I can't hope. And so all I can do, and this is the solution to it for me, is I just thank God for it and know that there are better things to come because God's promised it. See, the prayer the convergence of ourselves with God in prayer in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us. That's not just about our brokenness and our pain, although we'll talk about that next time. Um, It is not just about our brokenness and pain. It's also about the things that are so phenomenal and so powerful in our world that we can't explain it. And God says, yes, now that you're touching on something you can't explain, you're starting to capture who I am because a God that is worthy of your worship should not fit inside your mind. No matter how brilliant you think anybody is, no matter how brilliant I think I might be, a God worthy of my worship ought not to be a God I could understand. And that's the blessing where prayer is convergence. It takes us away from knowledge and into the the zone of faith where we trust God. Let's pray. It's kind of odd for me to say we don't need to understand and then me try to use words, God. So um, we just thank you for who you are and ask that you would help us to continue to grow spiritually. Help us to continue to experience what it is that you have for us and to be grateful for that. Amen. I should have